And my name's Melissa and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at the UCD Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 15th edition of the UCD In Conversation webinar series. Through this series, we welcome our alumni community from around the world to listen as fellow alumni, UCD academics and guests share their stories and ideas. The series also reflects UCD's rising to the future strategy and its four strategic themes, which are creating a sustainable global, sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world and empowering humanity. The format for this evening includes a 30 minute conversation followed by a Q&A session and we plan to wrap up by 8pm. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Your questions help us to connect and make this format more engaging, so please do send them along. We'll get to as many as we can. If for whatever reason you have to leave the conversation early or if you have a problem with your connectivity, don't worry, as we are also recording the session and it will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. So now it is my absolute pleasure to hand it over to UCD alumna Sarah Carey, who will be moderating tonight's conversation. Sarah is a well-known columnist and broadcaster. She has written for major broadsheets such as the Irish Times, Sunday Independent, Sunday Times and the Daily Telegraph on everything from economics to politics and technology and is also a radio and television presenter. Sarah will be talking to the director of the UCD Clinton Institute, Professor Liam Kennedy, as well as Professor Scott Lucas from the University of Birmingham. So I'll leave it to you, Sarah. Thank you, Melissa, and good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are in the world. You're very welcome to our conversation, and thank you for choosing us over all the many podcasts out there today. There's such interest in the US election. So as Melissa was saying, Liam is the director of the Clinton Institute. Clinton Institute at UCD. Scott is Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham and editor of EA Worldview, the International Affairs online publication. America is their expert subject. We're going to talk for about half an hour and then take your questions. So please send them in through the Q&A option. Now, the last conversation, and for me, one of the most memorable that I've had with Liam was the morning after Trump's inauguration on my old Talking Point show on News Talk with his UCD colleague, Graeme Finlay, and John Isle, now the business editor of the Irish Independent. I argued that Trump couldn't do too much damage because there'd be adults in the room and the constitution to restrain his worst instincts. The lads were grim and skeptical that morning. Were they right? Trump's supporters believe he has delivered for them. His opponents say the future of America is at stake. So I thought I'd start tonight's conversation with a quote from Norman Mailer. Liam included it in a piece he'd published that same morning in the conversation. Mailer wrote, our history has moved on two rivers, one visible, the other underground. There has been the history of politics, which is concrete, factual, practical, and unbelievably dull. And there is a subterranean river of untapped, ferocious, lonely, and romantic desires, that concentration of ecstasy and violence, which is the dream life of the nation. So Liam, after four years of Trump, what is the dream life of America today? <laughs> well, first of all, Sarah, thank you. Thank you for hosting. Um, thank you for reminding me of that moment four years ago. Um, very tense time for, for some of us who didn't really understand what was going on. Not sure I still do. But I remember that quote from Miller very well, and thanks for resharing it with me, the dream life of the nation. I think today, obviously, is something more of a nightmare. And I think partly the nightmare is there's no shared dream. I'll try and explain what I mean about that. Four years ago, I was shocked by the election of Donald Trump. I didn't see it coming. I didn't read it. I got it wrong. Um, I thought perhaps I should have the words professor of American studies removed from the door of my office at the time. So I've spent the last four years trying to really make sense of this. I published a book called Trump's America, a teacher course called Trump's America. I'm not sure I've made too much sense, but you know what? The Miller quote is quite helpful. What I got from it was this. Miller reminded me that America's liberal democracy is not its only reality, or if you like, not its only dream. In other words, it's a construct, it's a political mythology that people bought into for at least 40 or 50 years. I was one of those people. I wasn't growing up in America, but I looked at it as a liberal democracy. I invested in that idea emotionally and intellectually. I discovered in 2016, there was another America that although I kind of knew was there, I hadn't really seen up close before. 
And it scared me a little bit. And that's the America that has erupted. And that America has found its leader in Donald Trump. Now you can give that America different names. You could call it nationalist, or maybe you could call it nativist, but it's having an insurgent moment. And I think that's partly what we're seeing represented in this election, not just Democrats versus Republicans, but this insurgent nationalism against a residual, and I think still fragile liberalism. So I suppose in Mailer's vaguely psychoanalytical terms, this is a battle between the ego of America, Biden, and the id of America, Trump. Okay, so Scott, who is going to win that battle next week? Oh my gosh, <clears throat> I mean, I'm kind of torn between the idea that it's going to be Star Wars, where we finally blow up the Death Star, or it's going to be Sixth Sense, spoiler alert, where we find out we're all dead. Uh, I, at the moment, just trying to get analytic, uh, Liam's the one that can, you know, wax lyrical about what it all means. Biden's about an eight to one favorite to win. Um, and the reason why he's an eight to one favorite, about 88, 89%, which is better odds than Hillary Clinton, who was only a two to one favorite to win four years ago, is because of the uphill battle that Trump has in a number of key states. So if you can follow what Trump needs to do to win, first of all, he needs to win one of the three states that were pivotal in 2016. And that was Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Michigan and Wisconsin are almost beyond reach now. Biden's ahead by nine to 10% in the polls there. In Pennsylvania, he has about an 86% chance of winning. So Trump has to try to reverse that. But then that's not enough. Trump has to win in Florida, in North Carolina, where Biden is ahead. That's not enough. Trump then has to win the 50-50 state of Iowa. That's not enough. He has to win Ohio, which has now become a 50-50 state. Still not enough. He has to hold on to Arizona and Georgia, which have been Republican states since the 1990 presidential elections, 1990s but he is actually in tight races there. And in fact, he's actually behind um, in Georgia and in Arizona as we speak. Joe Biden only has to win one of those states to win the electoral college if this is a straight up election. The difficulty is this may not be a straight up election. And now this does get into Liam's idea from four years ago, which is that the dream of America kind of unravels because the system could unravel. It is quite possible that Donald Trump on election night will start by saying when the in-person voting comes in and if early returns say he's ahead, that's it, I've won, we can stop, no mail-in ballots. Now, of course, people will say, we well, have to count the mail-in ballots, you, you have to do that. And Donald Trump will say, no, they're, they're fraudulent, they're a hoax. Now that's a lie. There are only 1200 mail-in ballots across 40 years of election that have been fraudulent. But he'll say this is happening in the millions and he'll try to stop the count. And people say, no, 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 we have to count. And then he will bring out the lawyers. Uh, and Biden has his lawyers ready as well. But Trump will take this to the courts to say, you have to throw out the mail-in ballots. And this culminates in an approach to the Supreme Court, which takes us back around to September 22nd. When Donald Trump said one of the reasons why he wanted a woman named Amy Coney Barrett to be a Supreme Court justice was that he wanted a nine justice Supreme Court because millions of the ballots would be fraudulent. In other words, the difference here is he's being very open about this. He's being very open about the fact that if the system works where he loses, he will try to override the system, which isn't anything new because he's been trying to override the American system, well, ever since he took office in January, 2017. So Liam, uh, you know, back then when we talked, when Trump got elected, my hope was that the institutions in American democracy uh, would hold Trump back from doing the worst. Mm -hmm. How have they done over the past four years? And if the scenario Scott has outlined materializes, do you see the institutions? I'm talking about the constitution, the judiciary, Congress, uh, from ensuring that the result of the election is fairly counted and announced? Oh, the Constitution has partially held up, but I think one of the things we've seen, and Donald Trump has proved this, 
is it's it's not fit for purpose. I mean, you really have to understand this. This was this was written by our so-called founding fathers with a vision of America that's nothing like what we're looking at today. Nothing like it at all. I mean, largely agrarian country and so on. But one of the interesting things about their 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 writing of the Constitution is that they foresaw a Donald Trump. That's the irony of this, because they lived in an age where populist demagogues were fairly common, right? Plus, they didn't actually trust the American people for all their jargon about we the people, which is why they created something called the Electoral College. Can you see the ironies in this? The Electoral College is exactly what gets Trump elected. But the reason they had an Electoral College is because they were people who didn't trust the American people to vote for the right person. Now, lots of ironies there. On the other hand, the Constitution is a document which I think has... Um, Led, led America to develop a, um, a democracy unlike any other in the world, which has wonderful features, which we should admire. But nonetheless, one of the things that Trump understood very quickly is that a lot of those features were based on conventions and that it was fairly easy to break a lot of those conventions, mm -hmm. point one. Point two, just to give you one example of what's not working. The Senate is supposed to advise and consent, but whenever they created that idea, they had no idea that America could be as hyper-partisan as it is today. And that advice and consent is not advice and consent. It's just vote party line completely and do what the president tells you to do. So there's no balance or check going on in that kind of situation. Now, of course, we've seen lots of other forms of pushback. The Supreme Court has not done simply what Trump would like it to do. It hasn't been that straightforward. Um, but I think that although he has not broken the systems, I think he's deeply damaged them. I think if you give him four more years, I don't know what's going to be left. Scott, you know, everyone's a bit traumatized by the predictions that were made about Hillary winning. Is it possible that that fear is actually clouding us to another alternative, which is a landslide? And if it's the landslide, what does that mean, not just for a potential Biden presidency, but for the Republican Party? And when you're answering, I'd like you to take into account this idea of the emerging Democratic majority, this idea that, you know, by population changes alone, the Republicans realized some time ago they could simply never win a straight election like the one that you were talking about, and that therefore they have to find other ways to retain power. Um, so um, if it's a landslide, what would the Republican Party do next? Reconfigure, realign, try to attract minorities into uh, the party, or does it double down on finding a way to be a permanent government? Well, <clears throat> you need Mitch McConnell here right now, who is probably the most powerful man in America yeah, as a Senate majority leader. But yeah. first thing that a Biden landslide does, by the way, to bring back our earlier point is it probably preempts Trump challenging the election. That's going to be significant. So, for example, there's a chance now that I don't think Liam and I thought possible a few months ago that Biden and Harris could win Texas. Now, Texas has not voted for a Democrat president since 1976. You know, if Biden is winning there, then I think even Republicans in the Senate who have really been Trump's enablers and the other luminaries in the Republican Party are going to say, look, you got to back off now. I think what happens on a Biden landslide beyond that is really this question that Liam and I have discussed amongst ourselves and including with other people like Brian Kloss, uh, another analyst we highly respect, which is what happens with Trumpism? Now, the idea is, I think if, if it's a narrow defeat for Trump, then Trumpism survives within the Republican Party because he comes out and says, I would have won except for COVID. I would have won except for establishment Republicans that tried to stab me in the back. Uh, he'll play this whole idea that he's the victim, and he'll count on a lot of Republicans, especially those who've been in the House of Representatives and who have their own political aspirations, to join this Trumpist band. Whether it goes as far as Trump, for example, trying to create the dynasty, <laughs> Ivanka. Donald John Jr. wants to run for Senate in Pennsylvania, even though he's not a resident of Pennsylvania. That's already been marked out. But whether more seriously, it talks about Trump trying to further co-opt the media networks, you know, beyond the Breitbart's and the Foxes, this outfit called One American News Network. If it's a landslide victory, that option for Trump within the Republican Party, I think, doesn't work because he's damaged goods. Mm -hmm. If it's a narrower victory, the Republican Party goes into one of those realignments that all parties have to have at certain points. The Democrats had to have it before Clinton won in 1992. The Republicans did it before the 2000 election where little Bush came in. But the difference now is 
they've got an insurgent in their ranks. Donald Trump is not a Republican. He's not a Republican in terms of issues. He's not a Republican in terms of policies. Donald Trump is a family and friends party. But here's the problem. Everybody knows the emperor, the Trumpist, has got no Trumpist clothes. In other words, there's no substance to the policies. There's anti-immigrant rhetoric. There's anti-environmental rhetoric. All he can do is destroy. So you've got to talk about two things beyond just simply the Biden landslide to talk about it. First of all, do the key advisors who have been really powerful, like Stephen Miller, this 35-year-old advisor who came from nowhere and who's the driver of the Muslim ban, who's the driver of removing asylum, who is the driver of separating children from families, is he still considered persona grata within the Republican Party or is he turfed out? And secondly, what happens to the Senate? If the Republicans retain control of the Senate, Trump still has breathing space because the Republicans are still in and control one chamber of the two. If the Republicans get hammered in the Senate, that weakens Trump further because he'll be blamed not only for losing the White House, but for giving the Democrats control of Congress. Um, Liam, I'm very conscious as we're talking that the premise of our conversation is that Trump is a terrible person and uh, must be gotten out of American politics as soon as possible. But of course, there are an awful lot of people in America who disagree, who see him as having delivered quite comprehensively exactly what he promised. And in the appointment of Amy Comey Barrett, another pro-life Supreme Court judge. And even in Irish America, as you and I have talked before, lots of my relations in America, second and third generation, are Republicans, mm. despite the kind of common assumption that Irish America is uniformly Democrat. Mm. Um, do you want to say a word about them and um, you know what their stake in Trump and the Republican Party is? I think it's complex and it's an interesting area. I mean, we've, we've, there was a time when Irish America was thought of as a, a voting block, okay? In, in other words, there was something coherent enough there in that group of people that it was worthwhile reaching out to them and, and, and polling in relationship to them. Um, that's no longer the case. It hasn't really been the case since probably the 1950s. I would say Kennedy in 1960 was the last president who clearly had a block vote to support him. Now, there's reasons for that. I think some of them are pretty obvious. One is that um, Irish Americans are, are quite fully assimilated in the United States. Um, uh, and uh, that assimilation has meant that you no longer have a kind of ethnic environment that means that they function in that way as a sociological block or a political block. However, one of the interesting things about Irish America is it never quite dies, even though we keep saying it's dead or dying. Um, in 2010, at the last national census in the US, 33.5 million Americans ticked the Irish heritage box. Now, that's a lot of Americans, right? Now, let's be very candid. Some of them couldn't find Ireland on a map, but that's not the point. The point is that a lot of those Americans have a sense of being Irish. And it becomes interesting to consider the question, does that at any point become politically salient? Now, I'm not sure of the answer. It's a complex area because you're dealing with identity and the question of how people vote. They do not vote as a block, but I think there is a degree of salience there. And it probably resides in one of two areas. One is that we know, and pollsters know, that no matter which way they vote, the Irish vote in America, right? They are very politically invested. Clues of that are quite obvious. Look at the number of Irish Americans around Donald Trump. Look at the number of Irish Americans um, who are you know, leading commentators on news programs. At least half of them are on Fox, as far as I can tell. Uh, and, and look uh, at, at Joe Biden's background. But not only that, if you get time, look at the advisors around Joe Biden. Huge number of Irish Americans that work there too. So there is something going on with that Irish American political element. It's not a block, but it's invested and it's keen to be involved in the political process. The politicians know that. So they do, in a coded ways, talk to the Irish whenever they talk to uh, potential voters. The second ingredient, I'll be brief, um, and it's an important one for Biden, is not just to be Irish, it's to be Irish and Catholic, because the Catholic vote is a block uh, and a very, very important one. Uh, Trump carried it at the last election. There are signs that that vote is going to be much more split this time and that Biden certainly has peeled some of them away. So, yeah, there's a bit of life left in the old Irish Catholic vote even still. Good. Now, Scott, I want to go back to something that we briefly mentioned um, in the previous question, Mitch McConnell. And there's an idea that, you know what, while we've all been reading Trump's tweets and watching the Trump circus, the real action in terms of governance has been going on in Congress via McConnell. Will you 
tell us a little bit about him, what he's been up to and what his legacy will be, irrespective of the result of the election. Yeah, the, the thing about the American system, of course, is, you know, you've got court, you've got executive and you've got legislature and they should function in balance. But what Mitch McConnell saw in Donald Trump, and he wasn't the only one, is I'm going to use this guy who may not be a Republican, who may be an insurgent, who may be chaotic. I'm going to use him for my agenda. And McConnell's agenda, and he's been very open about this, is he wanted to pack the courts with conservatives. He had spent 11 months in the last year of the Obama administration blocking a replacement on the Supreme Court. He was going to get that nomination to be a conservative on the court, and he was going to do it all through the federal court system. So you're talking about hundreds of judges. So it's not just Amy Coney Barrett now. It's not just Brett Kavanaugh that you're talking about. He was also going to try to swing Congress in a sense, which even if you didn't get the policies through, there would be much more of a conservative tone that would be there. And he would do it in a sense which negated another group that we would talk about just before Trump came in, which was the Tea Party. Now, the Tea Party was sort of that populist movement from 2010 that came out of the Great Recession. And, and they were a real problem for the Republicans because they really were demanding small government, but they were actually saying, we don't trust Washington. What McConnell was going to try to do is say, look, we appreciate your concerns. Now we're going to act upon it. What happened is, is that at every point when Trump pushed the boundaries, McConnell had to make a decision, whether it was the wall with Mexico, whether it's when Trump declared a national emergency, whether it's when Trump threatened war with national Korea, North Korea, but then had a photo opportunity with it. Did McConnell basically go along with that type of behavior? And at the end of the day, he has. It has been an irony that that has not meant that the Republicans have been able to push through a legislative agenda. They failed to repeal Obamacare. They have failed to get any significant legislation through, indeed, in the past three years. And so what's had, what's had to happen? They've had to rely on Trump issuing executive orders. So it's not that McConnell controls Trump or Trump controls McConnell. In that codependent relationship, they felt like they could use each other and everything else gets pushed aside because in addition to overrunning the courts, they've overrun the agencies. There is almost no legitimacy now that Trump sees, for example, in the medical and public health professionals who are within handling the corona, uh, coronavirus. There's almost no legitimacy in the State Department if it doesn't do what it wants. There's no legitimacy in the US intelligence services. And where you could see this come out to its fruition is, is that when Donald Trump conspired with not one, but two foreign governments for his elections, Russia and the Ukraine, McConnell protected him. So the ultimate irony that we are here, in the past week, Mitch McConnell has had a priority to get Amy Coney Barrett through and confirm to Supreme Court justice. And the same Mitch McConnell, about 15 minutes after that vote came through, adjourned Senate with no vote on a $2 trillion relief package for those people who are suffering the effects of coronavirus. He's a power player. He's used Trump to advance his position, but he in turn has been used by Trump in a way. Can they ever break that very poisonous bond between them? Liam, does that survive Trump, that legacy? I think it's a good question. It's really hard to say. Um, you know, there's some similarities between what's happening with Trump in the US and, and, and other parts of the world with the, the, these insurgent nationalist movements and, and very often driven by populist politics. So uh, to what degree is this wrapped around Trump and Trump only or to what degree has, does it have energies beyond Trump? I think one of the things we can say in line with what Scott said is there's no policy agenda here, right? I mean, absolutely nothing. I mean, if you go back to the, the Republican convention in August, there was four days of just reality TV. Uh, there was no policy program, no policy agenda. Um, there was one, and that was to have enough black people appear who would say Trump wasn't racist um, because somehow that needed to be said. There, but there was no policy agenda. So moving forward, uh, that's a way of saying that Trumpism is not Thatcherism, right? It's not an ideological program. It just doesn't function that way. However, where does it go? Oh, I'm, I'm just looking at the question box. Somebody asked the question, what happens to the id, the underground river, if Biden wins? That's always a scary question. Watch your Hollywood movies. The id will always return. Uh, it never goes away. And that's something I had forgotten four years ago. I needed reminding of it. I suppose if I'm being a little... Um, cheeky about it, I would say 
maybe Trump has flushed out the American system in ways that are not all bad. And I, I mean that almost. I would rather not have had the last four years. But you know what? If you want to talk about something like Black Lives Matter, I think there's some really good changes happening in America right now. OK, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about race. Um, what, what has happened over the last four years when it comes to race, Liam? Well, again, you have, you have an element of the, the history and the culture of America that has been somewhat uh, repressed, if I go back to that metaphor again. I mean, we, we had a civil war in the United States um, and, and after the so-called period of reconstruction, that was not a period of reconstruction, right? Um, in the American South, certainly. So a period of, um, you know, a civil unrest was required in the 1950s and 1960s, sometimes called the second reconstruction, which did finally lead to legislation that had some purchase or the 1965 Civil Rights Act and a number of other important acts around housing and so on um, and employment. But again, it wasn't full freedom and franchisement for African-American peoples. And so we have the third great wave at this effort of getting recognition in the United States. Whether it would have fully broken through without the awful pressures that Trump created over the last four years, I'm not sure, but the important point is it has broken through. And I think it's been absolutely remarkable. I think it's the greatest social movement of my lifetime, not just Black Lives Matters, but around it, the other social protests have come. I include the women's protests as well. So this is an interesting moment. The United States has lost a lot of global standing over the last four years. I'm not sure it can get it all back again. But I have been struck in traveling around the world, or even not on, just staying in Ireland, that one of the things that people have looked at very positively in that time have been those protesters. They have looked at those protesters as the America that they admire and the America they want to see uh, come November. Yeah, um, but Scott, you know, let's not forget, I've just finished reading um, Good Economics, um, the book by Abhijit um, and Duflo, um, who, you know, they study poor economics and they're making the point in that, that there, there were people left behind uh, through globalization and internationalization and, and nothing has been done for them. And, you know, they voted Republican because the Democrats didn't do anything for them. Obama did nothing for them. Well, in, it's certainly in their views. Um, you know, so while what Liam is talking about in terms of, of race, you know, has a, a positive um, side coming out of, I, I keep thinking of what Susan Sarandon said. She said, the people are awake, you know, so the people are awake. But is that constituency still being left behind? And are we still ignoring their plight and criticizing them for voting Trump when they felt they had no one left to vote for and maybe still think that? Well, the first thing is, is that we shouldn't criticize them for voting Trump. You know, what you've already done in the question is you've recognized the fact that people felt resentment, people felt angry, people felt frustrated because the Great Recession was a very great recession. And even during the American recovery, there are certain things that have changed. The manufacturing pattern in the U.S. has changed. The shift between rural and urban has changed. What we have to recognize with Trump, before I answer your question directly, is, is that it's, you know, while those people may have voted for Trump, they didn't vote for the solution. You know, they voted for a guy. There's a Western series back in 1957, 58 called Trackdown, where people are scared in a community. They're scared that a disaster is about to hit them. And there is a snake oil salesman who comes in and says, give me your money. I'll build a wall around the town. You want to guess what the character's name was? The character's name is Trump. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if these guys had a crystal ball, but what they've actually done is, and getting back to a point we already talked about, my grandfather has said, you know, uh, the, there's a sucker born every minute and two to take them. And so there are people who will exploit honest fears of uncertainty. And indeed, culture of fear in America goes way back before Donald Trump. It goes back decades. Where it goes now in 2020 is, is that the snake oil salesman hasn't delivered anything beyond snake oil. The American economy had a tax cut in 2017, but it did not have a surge. It had a steady increasing growth, but it was based a lot on federal debt. It has been exposed during the pandemic and the mismanagement of the pandemic with the greatest contraction in American economic history. And so now that economic card is taken away from Trump. And the question is, what do you do for those people who still are uncertain about their futures and their kids' futures? And that's where I think it turns to 
where is the message that's coming out, not just through Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, but through the congressional candidates and the state and local level. And I do think there was a marker in 2018, which Liam has talked about, when you had that big swing to the Democrats in the midterm elections, it was in part a rejection of what Trump was, but it was in part saying, we want something better than this. We've had the spectacle, we've had the confrontation. Now we need something where there's a sense of community for all of us coming together. I do think there's a strand of right nationalism that Trump is capitalizing on. I do think he's capitalizing on other things, for example, and Liam knows his story well, my mother, bless her heart, who's in her 80s, will troll me on Facebook every day because I have been mean to Donald Trump. And she has just said, my husband and I have voted the way that God wants us to, and I hope the rest of you do as well. So there are people who are entrenched with Trump. But what the pandemic has exposed to bring this home is that now people don't feel secure and Donald Trump can't be the opposition guy to blame the other side. He's the one that has to carry the responsibility for it because he's the one that was nominally in charge for the past three and a half years. Okay, I'm gonna to go to the questions in a minute, they're flying in, but just Liam, I want to put one a final point um, to you from me. Look, I, I hate, to, I'm afraid to even say it, but I think Biden is gonna win, he's gonna win well. I think they're gonna take the Senate. Mm. The question is, what's he gonna do with it? And mm. can he do something, you know, for, uh, those people who've been left behind, for those people who, who voted Trump because they had nothing left to lose. Yeah. What can he do with the presidency if he wins? First of all, I agree that those people are there. Scott's, Scott's already said that. And um, though those, those people need to be um, respected. Um, I think this idea that um, they're um, duped simply by, by Trump is a mistake. I quite like the idea of Trump as con man. I think it fits. But I think if you really dig down... Um, I think a lot of the people who voted for Donald Trump, they, they see through him too, you know. I remember journalists going to, you know, interview some of Trump's voters and say to him, you know, what's he going to do, this idea of building a wall? And they said, they might not build a wall, who cares? He's just making you people crazy, that makes us feel good. You know, there's a dynamic there that I think it took uh, a lot of non-Trump supporters a long time to understand. But we still probably have to understand more. We have to understand why so many people in the United States not simply would vote for Donald Trump, but whether he's there or not, feel disenfranchised. And they feel, a lot of them, triply dis disenfranchised. They feel politically disenfranchised. That is to say, very distant from what they sneeringly call Washington. They feel um, economically disenfranchised because many of them are in parts of America where they have not seen their wages rise in 20 or 30 years if they have a, a job or one job. But thirdly, and I think this is crucial, they feel culturally disenfranchised. They do not believe that this is their America. They look at entertainment and they see the West Coast and the East Coast and the news media um, and Hollywood. Uh, they look at the universities and they see elites who talk down to them. Um, this is not their America. They feel that this America has been taken away from them. And this man, Trump, turns up and tells them that they're right. It's a very powerful message. Now, he's not on the scene. It's a really good question. Where does all of that discontent go? It has to be addressed. Biden has to address that. And, and on that, Scott, there's a question here from Anna Cronin. The title of this meeting is somewhat misleading as I'm clearly at another Let's Bash President Trump meeting. <laughs> Some of us understand America very well, having lived and worked throughout USA. The Democrats need an equal level of critical assessment. VP Biden as president, this is insulting. So put on your critical hat, you know, has everybody... Uh, maybe ignored questions about Biden because we don't care because he's just not Trump. And is that good enough? Well, I appreciate the question. And I think the first thing to say is it's not a question of bashing Donald Trump just to bash Donald Trump. And it's not a question of bashing Republicans to bash Republicans. What motivates me, and I'm sure it motivates Liam as well, is that these are issues that are beyond right versus left and Democrat versus Republican. You know, I've got relatives and friends in America who are threatened by this pandemic. I've got to tell you that. And it doesn't matter to me whether they vote Trump or vote Biden, they're all threatened. There are people in America who are threatened with the loss of jobs and they are Democrats and they are Republicans amongst them. Everyone is threatened by climate change. What we're talking about here is responsibility and competence and dialogue rather than division. 
So let's address your question. Will Joe Biden and Kamala Harris produce that when they're in office? I think Joe Biden, I would disagree with a number of his policy positions. I think he was too slow to act, for example, on racial and social issues when he was in the Senate. I think he and Barack Obama were a little bit too pragmatic when it came down to dealing with climate change. I think on foreign policy, which we haven't mentioned yet, that they were indecisive on certain matters. But Joe Biden plays by the rules of the game, and he plays by the rules of the game in working with members of the other party. One of his greatest friends was the late Senator John McCain. And that is one of the reasons why John McCain's widow has endorsed Joe Biden, you know, even though she's a Republican, because it's trying to bring people back together again. Do I think Kamala Harris will bring back people together? Yes, I, I genuinely do think so. Do I think those new representatives who came in, and there were Republicans as well, but also most of them were Democrats, in 2018 wanted to see a better America in terms of dialogue? I do think they do so. And there are very good Republicans out there who want that as well. There are very good Republicans who have spoken out, like Colin Powell, who served in the Bush administration, John Kasich, who was governor of Ohio, who are calling for the same type of dialogue and discussion like we're having right here. So the more we get away from the personality issues, and there's a social media question, which we may pick up in a minute, but reducing things to personalities and specials and say, look, what unites us in terms of the issues? That's important. I think the first thing that Biden and Harris will do, just to build on what Liam has said, is, is just to get adults back around the table. I think they'll do that, first of all, with the pandemic, where they will bring in the medical and public health experts who've been pushed to the side, because that's the immediate crisis. I think they'll bring in economic folks. So it's not just that some people recover and others don't. And I think they'll bring in people to talk about what we need to do with fundamental social reform that deals with the issues that affects all of us, whether we're people of color or not. And that type of honest, decent discussion would lead to an America that would cut against the polarization that we've had too much of in recent decades. And on that polarization, Liam, there's another question in from Owen Batican, um, which I think is, is, is bang on. What parallels do the panelists see between the Brexit vote and Trump voters in terms of those who've been left behind? And what alternatives are open to them? It's very similar constituencies, isn't it? They are quite similar constituencies. Uh, I don't think they're the same, but they're, they're similar. Um, one of the similarities we haven't really talked about is, 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 is how they break it down geographically. You find that is, is a similarity in that regard. Um, if you look at blue and uh, red America, just to remind everyone, if we're, <coughs> excuse me, if we're looking at blue, we're looking at um, Democrats, and if we're looking at the red, we're looking at the, uh, the Republicans, you will see a map in which the big cities <laughs> are mostly Democrat, and the vast swathes of more rural and semi-suburban America um, are Republican. And, and it's a very simple kind of you know, difference that you see there, but it tells you something about the ways in which um, America has begun to, to use a sociological term, sort itself. There was a book written 10 years ago called The Big Sort by Bill Bishop, in which he argued that America, Americans were preferring to live amongst like-minded Americans. They were sorting themselves into camps and groups. Now you put on top of that social media and the internet and the way that that functions basically to get people into silos and you have even more division. So th that kind of division, which is not only geographical, but also it's about communication and it's about the psychology of relationships has been building and growing in the United States. But you can see elements of that elsewhere and you can see elements of that in Britain. Again, I think you see a fairly stark breakdown in the difference between the urban and the non-urban in, 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 in the UK. There are other interesting breakdowns too, which have to do with age where you will find that those demographics map onto older communities being the more conservative, um, and you will find younger communities looking at their nation and its, 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 its relationship to the rest of the world in different ways. And I make that last point because, of course, it's that idea of what our nation is via, via the rest of the world that is at the heart of the fears in both of these countries. Uh, the fear of change, the fear of demographic change, the fear of people from elsewhere, you know, coming and taking things from us. Um, in the United States, there's been a projection for some time that it will become a majority minority nation sometime in the next 10, 20 years, depending on which poll you believe. Um, that idea is then sort of reproduced to fearmonger 
amongst more conservative politicians. In other words, America will not be white in 30 years time. Won't this be awful? It's an absurdly basic racist instinct that's being developed in that way. And Scott and I were talking about this earlier. I don't know if Scott wants to address it. But in fact, whenever you look at that fear of immigrants in the United States, the people on the border are not experiencing that. It's, 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 it's people who are far away from the border who are reacting in that way. So there are some, you know, and, and I think if you, if you move into to, 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 to Britain, I think those ideas of immigration are different um, and have a lot there to do with Britain's relationship to Europe. So let's not say we're dealing with the same thing in each instance, but there are strong um, xenophobic elements, I think, in both cases. Um, and Scott, on that, Anthony Puzan, he's asked a question that I think is important and feeds into that. Um, in our discussion, we've mentioned a landslide victory. And what would a landslide victory for either candidate, but in particular Biden, do for the American people's psyche? And, and this is the nub of it now. He says, whom do you believe would feel empowered and what groups could feel left out? And, and I'm often thinking now of the conversation we have about the conflict in Northern Ireland and how we've always urged people that the, the people with the power are the ones upon whom the obligation is to be generous and reach out to the minorities. If there's a Biden landslide, you know, could they be at risk of casting aside the deplorables and marching on into the great moral um, paradise, you, you know, with, with, with all the right thinking people? Well, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, and, and that's what a couple of questions have led to, which is, you know, in an America which has become polarized, does it become triumphalist, whichever way it goes? I think we've got a bit of precedent here, which is, I think, if we look back at 2009, which came after, again, another very uncertain period in American history, after 9-11, after the disastrous war in Iraq, after the start of the Great Recession, indeed, we were in the middle of it during that campaign. You had an Obama presidency. And I think whatever you think of President Obama's policies, I do think that his sense of ruling was to bring people together, was to try to unify and to rule across them. And for about two years, we had, for example, the passage of the Affordable Care Act. We had the stimulus package to deal with the Great Recession. We had that idea of trying to get to a consensus politics, but then it all came back up again. It came back up again with social media propelling it, he wasn't really born in the United States. He was born in Kenya. That there were, he was really a socialist or even a communist. In other words, there will be people out there. First of all, we need efforts to bring everyone together. And you want to hope that Biden, Harris, Democrats, whichever Republicans there, they all support that. But there will be people out there who aren't just simply angered or frustrated. There still will be the exploitative people who want to think, this is not my America and I'm going to do whatever means to try to get it back. And that's what I think well, we have to watch you, out for. Sorry, would you go further and say, and, and someone has asked this point as well, that in actual fact, Trump was a direct response to Obama. You know, the feeling that they had been excluded and talked down to. Well, I, I think there's two different levels that we're talking about. I think one is, is that we've already talked about it in a sense, and that is, is that it happened to be the Democrats who had been in power for eight years that even though there had been this economic growth in the United States, it didn't seem to be evenly distributed. And that motivated some people. But I think there's another element here that is not true. And that is, let us be very honest here. America's had to deal with a lot of social and racial divisions for decades. And those racial divisions came out with people who tried to undermine Obama because they simply didn't like him because he was black. And I just got to be very honest with you. Mm -hmm. There were people out there who simply don't understand the word socialism in the United States. So when everybody wants to undermine a politician, they say, this is socialism. In fact, even to the point where Barack Obama earlier this week had to say, Joe Biden's not a socialist, by the way, just to, to make sure of that. Now, the same thing will happen. And we need to be aware of this. The same thing will happen. You will still have a Fox TV network. You will still have Breitbart. You will still have One American News Network. You will still have Pajamas Media. And they will go out all that they can from day one to say that Biden and Harris don't represent you. And what Biden and Harris and the rest have to say is, we do represent you, but we represent you along with others who represent you. It is a very tall order. There's been a lot of damage to the American system. But I do think, for example, that you're talking about change realities that they'll have to deal with. There will be a change Supreme Court. They will not try to remove Amy Coney Barrett. So you have to talk about restoring the balance between the legislature, the presidency, and the courts. 
And my worry is, is that people will think that the division in America is so entrenched and that people will exploit that through disinformation that we won't get the time and the space we need just simply before you can solve things, you got to put adults back around the table, whether it's your household, whether it's the town hall, or whether it's the United States. Do they have the space and time just to bring everyone back around the table to say, what is it we want to achieve together? Liam, there are a few questions about social media, you know, and you've both referred to it. Um, Ronan McFeely is saying, you know, what is the impact of social media in this year's elections? You know, based on what Scott's just said, you know, about the need to try and bring people back around the table, is that possible anymore? When you do have social media polarizing people and creating the echo chambers that Kaz Seenstein, you know, originally um, referred mm. to, is it, is it too late? I'm afraid I think it is, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I know others would disagree, and I think Scott would disagree. Uh, there always comes a point in, in my discussions with him where I go the pessimistic, but he goes the optimistic route. He goes high, I go low, if you want to put it that way. That's, 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 that's useful as well. I really think the genie is out of the bottle in this. I'm, I'm really concerned. Um, I think this hyper-partisanship that we've talked about, polarization in the United States, the big sorting, all the rest of it, all of that precedes Trump. It's been going on for 10, 15, you could even say 20 years. The culture wars are at least 40 years old. None of that stuff is new. What is relatively new are the media platforms that are now helping to drive and facilitate this. And uh, that, 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 that's what worries me because those are set up to drive emotional languages. That's how the algorithms work, right? If we're sitting here having a reasonable conversation, chances are it's not gonna to do too well on those platforms, yeah? You need the heated language. You know this, Sarah, you have to be heated to get heard and so on and so forth. And there's no one more heated than Donald Trump, all right? He understands this. He absolutely understands this. He's the Twitter president in that regard. But you add to that the other disinformation threats. Um, interesting thing about this election, and we, we, we had a conversation with a, uh, a gentleman who's a, a, an expert and disinformation a few nights ago in a webinar and he said that what's um, um, more worrying about this election in terms of social media is the foreign threats are nothing like as dangerous as the domestic threats so he said last time around we became accustomed to the idea it was mainly a foreign threat you know Russia was interfering they were hacking the Democratic Party's uh, laptops and so on now we have domestic people who looks like they're possibly stealing and hacking Hunter Biden's laptop, but never mind them. We have a, a host of actors now um, who are investing in delegitimizing this election. And only a few of them are foreign. A lot of them are domestic. And a lot of them are helping drive ideas about voter fraud and helping to create that illusion that this is something that we should be seriously concerned about. Scott gave you the figures on voter fraud earlier. Now look, voter fraud was a fact in American history. In fact, America couldn't have been created without voter fraud if you go back 150 years ago. And by the way, the Irish were at the heart of it. That's true. Story. Uh, especially in the Democratic Party in New York. But today, there is no voter fraud in the United States, except for these very few examples, which get magnified by this conservative media verse, the mothership of which is Fox News, but surrounded by all these satellites like Breitbart and, and QAnon and so on. And what they construct is this idea that voter fraud is the reality and we should be frightened of this. So we have a poll recently in the United States that tells us over 50% of Americans believe voter, voter fraud is a reality. I was speechless. I'm speechless now. You're never speechless, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that, that your amusement at that is, is exactly feeding into my next question. We have a comment from Michael Sullivan and thanks, Michael. You know, and he's making the point that, you know, again, we're completely out of touch, right? He says he lives in a deep blue state and the energy for Biden is like a dead battery. It doesn't exist. Mm. He said Biden is a corrupt career politician who is owned by the Communist Party in China and has sold out the middle class. When are you going to talk about Hunter's laptop? Right. Now, you know, so we'll read that and we'll go, oh, for God's sake, you know, that that's mad. But that may not speak to the people who believe that being out of touch. That speaks to our inability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes where they actually do believe this. And there can't be adults in the room and sitting around a table and all getting along with each other. If we're the ones saying, you're completely nuts. Hunter's laptop? What? You know, so have we a road to travel? rather than, than looking at the other side and thinking, what's wrong with you guys? But Michael, we're not saying you're nuts. We know that you have read somewhere that 
there was this laptop which shows that Joe Biden and Hunter Biden made millions out of China and that they conspired with elements, Ukrainian politicians, to get pay for play, meetings with Joe Biden in return for access to it. But here's the facts around the story that, in fact, Hunter Biden is in Los Angeles, California, and this laptop was dropped off in Wilmington, Delaware. He was nowhere near this. Here's something else that is quite interesting, that in fact, the man at the shop said he didn't know it was Hunter Biden, yet there was a receipt that was made out to Hunter Biden. Here's another fact, that there were people who were shopping around emails from Hunter Biden in Ukraine for up to $5 million. In other words, Hunter Biden's laptop had been hacked, even though it wasn't Hunter Biden's laptop that appeared in Delaware. And here's another interesting story that for almost a year, a guy named Rudy Giuliani, who's the president's attorney, was trying to create this type of story by talking to pro-Russian Ukrainian contacts. In other words, this was the October surprise to come out of those meetings, which almost led to, by the way, the conviction on impeachment trial of Donald Trump. So we're not disregarding you. We're saying, go to the facts. So for example, Michael, when you say, there's no motor voter fraud, out of touch, I live in Chicago. Liam and I are quite happy to talk to you about Mayor Daley, and we're quite happy to talk to you about the 1960 election. But people recognize that this did go on in the past. And it's not me, it's the Conservative Heritage Foundation that has monitored voting fraud or votes over the past 40 years and only 1,200 ballots across state and national elections. So by all means, put these points on social media. And this is why I become an optimist as opposed to Liam. There are about 150 of us that are here right now. And each of the 150 of us go out there and we talk to another 20, 30, 40. We've got a discussion going on. In other words, we've got a big version of Arlo Guthrie's Alice's Restaurant. If it's one person, it's a lunatic. If it's two people, it's a dangerous same-sex relationship. But you get 50, 100, 150 in a room and you got an Alice's Revolution and a revolution which uses social media in a positive way, still has hope, despite all those forces that are trying to turn it against us. Um, it's coming up to eight o'clock, and I'm going to ask both of you for some final comments. Um, Liam, when we were chatting before this event, you were talking to me about the reckoning. What do you mean by that? Uh, and what reckoning is coming in this election? Actually, I wasn't talking about the reckoning in terms of the election per se. In my mind, the reckoning is very much to do with race. Uh, I think that's the reckoning that's needed in America. Um, racial division um, is the original sin of the United States. It was there in its creation. Um, I don't know that it would ever disappear, but there has to be a reckoning. There has to be a recognition of the history, and there has to be a recognition of the people who are actively wanting to be recognized fully as part of America. But if we talk about things like voter suppression and look at the history of that, it's a deeply racialized history. A lot of the history of voter suppression in the United States is simply to stop black people from voting. Donald Trump has continued that awful tradition. That is clear. That is what Scott would call a fact. And that is what that is. So I have some hope in that I've seen signs of that reckoning, probably for the first time really in my lifetime. And uh, there's so much else to look for in what's going on in the United States right now. That's where I'm keeping my eye. And that's where I'm, I'm hoping that that reckoning will come. And Scott, you know, of course, we live thousands of miles from America, but everyone has their eye on this election because America's place in the world matters. What do you think that place in the world will be after the election? Don't, don't make it America. Make it our place in the world for Americans or the rest of us. Look, four years ago... Um, and indeed, after that, I've, there's been towns when I've been down, not just about being America, but living in Brexit Britain. Hi, y'all. Which has been that sort of the negative elements would come forward, the insults, the abuse, the, the anger, the frustrations with no attempt at reconciliation, which is a very powerful and much needed term. But then I remember the day after Donald Trump's inauguration that uh, the Women's March that was even bigger than Donald Trump's inaugural crowd. 
And those people were not there for bitterness. They were not there out of spite. They were there to say, these issues matter to us. We want to be heard. And after the tragedy at Parkland in 2018, um, where you had what, 15, 16 staff and students killed, those students went out and led marches, went out there and mobilized people to talk not only about gun control, but about economic and social justice. And then this past summer, despite all the stigma, despite everything thrown at them, despite the, the, the attempt to bring the military out to them, millions of Americans coming out, not just black, black, white, all people of color, saying, look, we want a better America. We want a just America. It might be our original sin, but original sin doesn't mean you always have to repeat the sin. I think we're beyond America leads and the rest of us follow. My God, I hope we are. Because I don't think that does us any good to say that any country in the world, not even Ireland, should be the one that sets the lead and everybody follows in the path. But I think the idea of a more cooperative American community, cooperative within itself, and then cooperative with others. Because folks, at the end of the day, when you're talking about climate change, it does not recognize national borders. When you talk about those who are oppressed, whether they're in terms of different color, immigrants, refugees, they don't know national borders. That concerns all of us. A pandemic doesn't know national borders. And that sense of responsibility, it isn't just Joe Biden saying responsibility. It isn't a single politician. It's up to each of us saying, how do we conduct our lives responsibly in terms of getting back to that notion of a decent and honest society? Scott Lucas, Lean Kennedy, many thanks uh, for contributing to the conversation this evening. I really enjoyed it. And I will hand you back now to Melissa from UCD Alumni. Thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating discussion that could have gone on for hours, I'm sure. Um, but we're coming up to eight o'clock now. So I just want to say a big thank you um, from all of us at the UCD Alumni Relations team to Sarah, Liam and Scott. Um, absolutely brilliant um, discussion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be recording the session, so um, it will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. If you want to watch it back or share it with others, um, the YouTube channel will be linked within the chat box now. Um, a couple of just other quick notes before we head off. Um, for the month of November, there's going to be a special takeover of the UCD In Conversation series, hosted by UCD alum alumnus Pat Kenny. The focus will be on our alumni awardees for 2020. And next Thursday, we'll be, we'll be, we will be joined by social sciences alumna Sharon Donnery, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, along with arts and humanities alumnus Dalton Phillips, who is the CEO of the Dublin Airport Authority. We would love for you to join us and um, if you're interested and the link will be um, put in the chat function below. So feel free to register and come along. Um, I'd also just like to quickly mention that UCD is committed to supporting our students, both current and incoming through the COVID crisis. To date, over 300,000 euros have been raised by generous alumni and friends of UCD. Thanks to all of you who have supported this important cause. And if you would like to support our efforts further, please, um, please review the link in the chat box as well. Finally, if you have any suggestions for any future conversation topics, we would love to hear from you. So email us at alumni at ucd.ie and let us know what your thoughts are. So once again, thank you so much all for your time this evening and a special thanks to our speakers, Liam, Scott and Sarah. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.